Thank you for choosing to watch our video. Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon for notifications of new content. Leave us a comment and watch the other videos that we're happy to provide for you. And now, on to the sermon. And today, while we think about what's going forward and thinking about hope, we're going to talk about being radical. And no one likes to be called a radical. A lot of people identify the fact of being a radical as someone who doesn't have a whole lot of control. Or someone who's mindless. Or someone who's emotional. Or someone who's given over to cultish behavior. But I've got to admit, I don't really know how else you describe the process of conversion. Because let me take you through this just very, very quickly. So the idea of conversion, just verses that are in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27. It is a self-crucifixion. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, it is a death, a burial, and a resurrection. A little bit further down in Romans chapter 6, it is an enslavement to Jesus Christ. In John chapter 6, which we brought up in the, very, in the second lesson of this series, it's being drawn to God. That's part of conversion. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, along with Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, that's a really famous passage. It is a transformation. It is a metamorphosis. Because we're trying to become more and more like Jesus Christ. It is, in Acts chapter 14 and verses 21 and 22, being a part of a family. And as we are parts of a family, then what we are trying to do is help each other to become more like Jesus Christ. And then finally, in John chapter 4, if you'll turn there, in John chapter 4, it is a radical change of relationship. It is a radical change of the manner of our life. That is radical discipleship. And like I said, while we may shun away from the term radical, I don't really know how else to describe it. Because radical discipleship is putting everything, everything, second to Jesus Christ. It is working, it is walking, it is living, it is acting all within the shadow of Jesus Christ. And one of the greatest ways that we're going to find this and we're going to be able to see this today is by looking in John chapter 4. So if you'll turn with me in John chapter 4, we get the opportunity with the woman at, the, at Jacob's well in Samaria to learn all of these great principles. So we're going to see some principles about her and then kind of draw it to a conclusion with a larger principle, a more applicable principle, a principle that I hope is so noteworthy that you won't soon forget it. Let's go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. This woman, as you might imagine, in John chapter 4, this woman... This woman was an absolute outsider. This woman was an outsider. And as she was an outsider, we're going to make some really important observations. Let's turn first of all to John chapter 4, and we're going to look in the fourth verse. This woman was, and I'd already mentioned, a Samaritan. John chapter 4, verse 4, but he needed to go through Samaria. When we look down in verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Then in verse one, 9, the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink for me? A Samaritan woman, no Jews have dealings with the Samaritan. She was a Samaritan. And as we step through this, I want to give you first of all, the fact that she was a cultural outsider. A cultural outsider. We just read John's, this is almost kind of like a footnote for John in John chapter 4 verse 9, that the Jews have no dealings with Samaria. She was, as far as the Jews were concerned, their enemy. They even would refer to them as dogs. This was not a 
pleasant relationship between these people. And as we go a little bit further, and we consider it a little bit further, they had no dealings like verse 9 says. They had no dealings between the Jews and the Samaritans because the Samaritans were, and it's not a very pleasant term, but it's the term that they would refer to, they were a half-breed. A half-breed. Because they were produced by the union of the Assyrians after they were taken in, after they took the northern nation of Israel into captivity and then brought them back. That was the Samaritans. So here was this woman, first of all, the ultimate outsider, being a Samaritan, culturally away from anything that anyone would have ever possibly wanted. Secondly, though, let's look a little bit further. Let's look down in verse 20. Let's look down in verse 20 because this woman, this woman in John chapter 4 and the 20th verse, this woman was religiously wrong, which as you might imagine makes her a religious outsider. John chapter 4 and verse 20 says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So she would have believed as a Samaritan. And Samaritans actually still believe in this. In fact, there's actually still Samaritans alive today. There's not many of them. But they believe only in the first five books of Moses. So she would have disallowed or not believed in the rest of the books of the Old Testament. And this made her religiously wrong. I mean, the way that God intended the Jews to worship Him was to worship Him with all of the Old Testament. And because of this, this made her again a religious outsider. Someone who was religiously wrong. As we keep on looking, let's look down in verse 9. Let's back up to verse 9. And then we'll look in verse 27. And this is obvious, but still we read it. John chapter 4, verse 9. She was a woman, the woman of Samaria. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? And of course, I said John gives the idea about the Samaritans, but he doesn't mention a woman. We need to talk about that. Let's go on down into verse 27 and see what's written there. Verse 27. As we look down into verse 27, and at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Now remember, it didn't say a Samaritan, but with a woman. What do you see? Why are you talking with her? So this made her, this made her a powerless outsider. A powerless outsider. Women in the first century, as probably many men who have stood in this place have told you, women in the first century were little more than property. In our country, we have for several decades really, really sought to have an equal standing between men and women. And while there would be probably both pe people in both genders who would say that there's still inequality, it is absolutely a fact that it is far, far different than the way that the first century Jewish people viewed women. So this made her powerless. This made her really not able to do much of anything in first century Jewish life. Now, one more. Let's look in verse 13. Let's look in verse 13. She was ungodly. John chapter 4 starting in verse 13. So John chapter 4 starting in verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Well, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, and I'll mention the water here in just a minute, that I may not thirst nor come down here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. Well, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. This made her, this made her a moral outsider. A moral outsider. 
the fact that she was not what she was supposed to be opened an avenue for Jesus to make the case to try to convert her. And as we'll see here in just a second, this case was something that was built on evidence. And as it was built on evidence, it produced the, resi the desired result. But this woman, the point is, as you're looking at this list in front of you, every way that you cut it, this woman was an outsider. Whether it was religiously, whether it was morally, whether it was culturally, or whether it was her standing in society. She was an outsider. But brethren, that didn't stop Jesus Christ. Because what Jesus sought to do was to actually try indeed to convert her. And that's actually the next step that I want us to look at. Let's look at the reaction. John chapter 4. Now, John chapter 4 and verse 28. We won't look at this in order, but we look at it in a particular order to make a specific point. John chapter 4. Now let's look in verse 28 because this woman does something that is seemingly very, very innocent, but there's a point behind it. John chapter 4 verse 28. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said unto the men, we'll pick up that in just a second, she left her water pot. This is a great illustration of the gospel overtaking priorities in someone's life. This is a very, very small, minuscule look into conversion. Remember as we started in conversion, and I'll let you see the list of how conversion is described. And you look at all of that list, and you come to the conclusion that it's pretty radical. She left her water pot. And as she had this change begin to come on her, ladies and gentlemen, she began to show the nature of what true discipleship is going to be. And I would ask the question, when we become disciples, You've got to ask yourself, am I too busy to leave my water pot? This woman wasn't. This woman wasn't. Let's look at another instance. Let's look down in verse 28. Now let's read in verse 29. 28 and 29. The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? This woman believed. This woman believed. Now I just want to suggest to you that two things were done in Jesus' conversion of the woman. And you could probably break it down into more. But just for the sake of time and for the sake of a quick analysis, I want to suggest two of them. Jesus, first of all, piqued her interest. So how did He pique her interest? She comes drawing water. He asked for water. They get into a conversation. And he begins to talk to her about living water. Remember I said that we talk about living water here in just a second. So what is living water? Well, living water, the, the Jews understood living water. They had an idea of a physical living water. Water that was in a pool that was stagnant was to them dead. If it was running, if it was in a stream, probably a lot of us had drunk water from a nice, cool running stream. That was living water. So Jesus takes kind of the difference between those two. And he's saying that a living water is not the dead part. It's not going to be the Jewish religion. It's not even going to be the Samaritan religion. That, very soon, is going to be dead. The living water is the riches of God's grace and mercy that was quickly coming through His sacrifice. So what does he do? He hooks her with that. He piques her interest. And notice, he piqued her interest with truth. He didn't have to throw out something that was trendy. He didn't have to throw out something that was faddish. He didn't have to throw out something that appealed to her on some different level other than spiritual. He piqued her interest. Secondly, he showed her evidence. Secondly, he showed her evidence. 
Now we've already read this section, but I want us to go back. I want you to go back to look in John chapter 4, and now let's look in verse 19, because after he had explained everything that had taken place, after he'd explained everything that had taken place, now if you'll look in verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Jesus knew the hearts of men. It's mentioned more than once in the Gospel. And as Jesus had first met this woman here at the well, He knew her. He knew her life. He could peer into what she was and He could accurately tell it. That was evidence that made her see that this was truly the Christ. Now, brethren, when we think about this, when we try as disciples, radically converted, transformed disciples, then we think about our main task. And our main task is to go out and make more disciples. How can we do it? We can pique people's interest, and then we can show them evidence. Because when we do that, we may think that compared to know everyone else compared to all the other religious groups that that what we offer may may seem to be pretty tame uninvited not exciting enough all i want to do is suggest to you that when we take that approach we're doing exactly what jesus christ did and to be honest as we think about this in this new year how could you ever ask for anything more than just doing what jesus did So this woman believed, but we're not done yet. This woman believed because this woman also, as you look in down in verse chapter 4, verse 28 and verse 29, this woman also evangelized. We used these verses a second ago. She walks away from the water pot. She goes into the city. And then in verse 29, we know it by the fact that she believed in the earlier point just a second ago. But look what she does in 29. Come see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So. So. This was one of the greatest parts about looking at John chapter 4 is the fact that you see the element of making disciples without there ever being any explanation, without there ever being any command. What did she just do? She just did it. She just walked into it. This was something very earnest, and this was something very intentional. A goal that you can have for 2023. I don't know what all your goals are. You've probably already been thinking about it. You may even have it all set in stone. Let me suggest one more. This woman was not a woman who went through the motions. This woman, once she believed and once she latched on to the truth that very quickly would become the gospel embodied that the apostles would go out and preach and teach and people would respond to by the thousands. She latched on to it and then she went out and she told it. She taught it. She lived it. Brethren, I can't ask for a show of hands because no one would show me their hands. But how many of you are here because you just want to go through the motions? How many of you are here because... In, in the broad depth of spirituality, you're right here on the top, just skimming the surface. That's not what this woman was. And by the power of the Gospel, that's not what you can be either. Because you can be better. You can be someone who is a radical disciple. We just need to follow this lady's example. Let's note just one more. Let's note just one more. She not only got after it, she not only evangelized, but then I just want to note 
she persuaded. And let's look down in 29 again. Come see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So now in 30, following this up, then they went out of the city and they came to Him. Let's go down in verse 39. Let's go down in verse 39 because this helps us just a little bit more. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed in Him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to Him, they urged Him to stay with them. And He stayed there two, two days. And many more believed because of His own word. Now I take from that and I hope that I'm not going too far. But what I take from that, when we're trying to convince people of the gospel, is a twofold approach, so to speak. People have what we say, what we teach, what we testify, if you want to use that word. I have no problem with that word. People have our lives. Our lives are a testimony, our, our lives are teachable moments. But what we do is that we, rightfully so, direct people to the Word of God. We know, we know that the Word of God is what has the power to convert people. So this woman, the text tells us that these Samaritans believed because of what she said and they also believed because of what he said. Now again, I take from that, hoping to not go too far, but I take from that the fact that we can be radical disciples. We can try to teach other people by our words, our actions. And we also draw other people closer to Jesus Christ. And as they learn more about that word, then the same effect is taking place that the woman had in John chapter 4. Radical discipleship. I mean, when you think about it, it is absolutely tremendous. So that's the woman at the well. This is the woman who is a complete outsider, but then you see, as Jesus came to her, the complete opposite reaction. I think it's marvelous that that woman, the day before she met Jesus Christ, her present, and her past was one of no hope. But after meeting Him, and listening to Him, and believing in Him, everything changed. That's radical. So now let's move on to our last illustration. This is the one that I hope that you're going to remember for a while. And what I want you to remember is that you need to get out of your aquarium. Charles Simpson tells a story about meeting a man who dove for exotic fish. So he would go down, he would dive for exotic fish, he would capture them, then they would make their way into pet stores to be sold. And this diver made the, made the point that one of the most sought after fish is the shark. Is the shark. And the shark has the capacity to stay within its aquarium. So if you stick a shark in a very, very small aquarium, it literally will remain just inches long. You put it out into the ocean or into a really, really large tank and it reaches its normal 8 to 10 feet. And this writer, Charles Simpson, said, that happens to a lot of Christians. He said, I have seen some of the cutest little 6 inch Christians who swim around a little bit in a puddle, but if you put them into a larger arena, into the whole creation, only then, only then, can they become great. So the question that we're left with for the last few minutes, how do you become great? How do you become a radical disciple 
How do you get out of your aquarium? So let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10 and the 24th verse says this, and it is one that has been quoted and looked at many, many times. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. There is a lot. A lot that we can do collectively. It is why we work so hard to get people here. Because we know what being together accomplishes. However, I've got to step back from that just for a moment and tell you that no matter how many times you are here, you could be here every single time that we schedule an assembly. But the balance of growth is not going for you to be on us. It's going to be on you. It just has to be. In fact, George Eliot one time wrote that the strongest principle of growth lies in human choice. So today is a good day for you to examine yourself. Because what we need to understand and what we need to do in the, in the final closing minutes is figure out how do I get out of the aquarium. Okay? So I've got some questions for you. Starting a new year. And we're starting to think about and we're starting to look at how do we become radical disciples? First of all, let's ask the question. Let's ask the question. Are you growing in your knowledge of the Word? How is your knowledge of the Word? So breaking this down a little bit, let me ask some follow-up questions. Are you spending time in the Bible? Are you learning more about Jesus Christ? Are you engaged in some kind of plan? A couple of days ago, I passed around a couple of different plans. And there are several of you who take advantage of this throughout the year, and I would encourage you to do that. You know, take advantage of, of setting yourself up a time that you're going to spend in the Word of God every day. And if you'll notice, some of those plans, one of those plans, the life of Jesus, is not an extensive reading. I mean, everyone would have the, the number one, you know, comeback would, would be. Kyle, I just can't hardly find time. Particularly the one about the life of Jesus. The readings are so fairly small every single day that you've got a great opportunity to spend some time in the Word. I mean, I, I couldn't be, and all of the other elders would say the same thing, I couldn't be more appreciative of what our Bible class teachers do. In fact, the, the rotation is changing over. I mean, here in just a few minutes. I couldn't be more appreciative of what you do and how you help this whole congregation. But I'll tell you, how you're going to grow this year is going to be dependent not on them, honestly not even on me. It's going to be dependent on you. Psalm 119 verse 105 talks about this Word of God being a, lamp, a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. And we've got to understand, am I spending more time in it? So secondly, here's another question. Let's go to James chapter 4. Let's go to James chapter 4. How's your relationship? How's your relationship with God? How's your relationship with Jesus Christ? Because Mike Cope observed there is a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing God. That's very, very true. A big difference between knowing about God and knowing God. In fact, even in our lesson last week, last Sunday evening, we talked about knowing the, the person and the character of God and we looked at some of the scriptures, some of the beautiful scriptures that describe the character of God. So you can take these scriptures, you can commit them to memory, you can remember the words in your mind and you can know about God. But it is different than knowing God. 
So James chapter 4, I've asked you to turn there to the 7th verse. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. That single verse starts putting together within all of us the concept of how I begin to know God and Jesus Christ more. We continue on. Draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will do what? He will lift you up. So if I spend time in learning to submit to God, in learning that my own actions don't produce the, the glory and the righteousness of God, unless I'm directed by Him, unless I carve out a, a little bit of time every day to read it, to meditate on it, to think about it, to then kind of take it and understand how can I change my life and be a better person today, then I'm not really coming to know God. And that's what I've got to do in order to get out of my aquarium. Let me give you another question. How are you maturing in your discernment? Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1 because this was a prayer of Paul. Philippians chapter 1, we'll read the whole prayer, but it's only three verses. Philippians chapter 1, and let's look in verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. That's discernment. It's discernment that I want to focus on. We brought up knowledge. We learned the knowledge. If we get into a, a really good systematic way of looking at the Bible every day, if you come here, if you study, if you apply yourself, if you listen, the knowledge is going to grow. However, there is one step beyond knowledge, and it is quite a startling word, discernment. So let's keep going in verse 10 that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Then finishing the prayer, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. So what is discernment? What is discernment? I can have knowledge. What is discernment? Discernment is me taking that knowledge and then being able to make the best decisions from the knowledge that I'm learning. Because let's face it, life is just a bunch of decisions. And whether you're a husband, or a father, or a wife, or a mother, whether you're a child, whether you're in school, whether you're on the job, your life is made up of decisions. And those decisions reflect one thing encapsulated in one word, and that one word is priority. Priority. Discernment means that you are able to look at all of the events of the day, all of the events of the year, 2023 maybe, and as you come across every one of those events, Every day, you've got a decision to make. Discernment means that you're going to put the kingdom of God first. Here's a decision that I could make. That decision leads me closer to God, or that decision leads me further away from God. Here's Sunday. Here's Wednesday. I've got a decision to make. That decision can either lead me closer to God, or farther away from God. See, brethren, that's discernment. And Paul said, I don't want you to just grow in your knowledge. I want you to grow in your discernment. I want you to be able to take that knowledge and then when the decisions come, to make the right ones. To make the holy ones. To make the ones that are going to push you toward greater strength. Toward being a disciple. I brought up before in this list of lessons that, that we... I mean, we call ourselves Christians, and we can. It's biblically correct. Are you a disciple? A disciple is someone who has discernment. 
looking at what is taking place and making the right decision for godliness every single time. Because remember, it's not just you. Especially if you're a husband and a father and a wife and a mother. You've got little ones. And those little ones are looking to you. They're learning discernment from you. So the decisions that you make, again, closer to God, further away from God, they're learning those decisions. And they're learning true discernment, spiritual discernment. Don't let them down. You've got to get out of your aquarium. There's one more question I want to leave you with. One more question I want to leave you with. Is your character becoming more like Christ? D.L. Moody said this, and it's honestly a pretty, it's, it's kind of a piercing thing. Character is what you are in the dark. I've, I've heard it put different ways. Character is what, what you are when no one else is around. But I like this because it's so concise. Character is what you are in the dark. So what are you in the dark? Because if you are an angry, bitter Christian, then the fact of wearing the name of Christian isn't going to do any good. If you're someone who loves the, the works of the flesh, if, if you're someone who loves division and sowing discord, if you're someone who loves sexual immorality, if you're someone who loves all of the other moral sins of gambling and dancing and drinking, etc., you're not a Christian. You're not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because in 1 Peter chapter 2, when we look in the first two verses, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and looking in the first two verses, here's what Peter says, Therefore laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, and we could list a whole lot more, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you're going to be a real disciple, you're going to exhibit the characteristics of a disciple. So I ask you, in this year, in 2023, are you starting to show more of those qualities that show Christ-likeness? Is there more love and joy and peace and goodness and kindness and patience and long-suffering in your life? Is there more self-control? Is there more wanting to be among the assembly of the saints? Is there more wanting to be within a relationship with God and Christ and within the Word itself? Because that shows growth. And I'll have to admit, I'll have to admit, it's pretty radical. Jesus had a radical conversation. It was a transformational conversation. This woman left something completely different than what she was before. She left the water pot. Because why? Because she had more priorities. What is that called? Discernment. Jesus is able to face every obstacle. And, and just thinking real quick, here was every obstacle with this woman. Man versus woman, Jew versus Samaritan, holy versus sinner. And He overcame them all. And He still does today. Our whole point, our whole thrust, our whole focus, every year, but you've got to admit, it's incredibly convenient as we begin on the first day of the year. Our whole thrust is to make sure that we can be completely transformative people. And this woman at the well shows us. And then with the added, I hope, the added benefit of realizing that we need to get out of our aquarium. Because that's only where we can truly be what God wants us to be. So we have an invitation. It is an invitation that we bring up every single time. It is an invitation, yes, yes, to become a Christian. But it's, an also, it's also an invitation to become a disciple. And discipleship is something that is very, very real. However, 
It is something that takes a lot of very closely guarded steps over a long, long period of time. A lot of people are committed. Are committed to getting in the water. But a lot of people, unfortunately, aren't committed to be a disciple. Now, we want people who are both. And the invitation is for people to do both. You know, one of the reasons why it's very careful in everything that we say is that we want people taking this step because they're ready to actually become a disciple. They're ready to go through that radical nature of conversion, just like we listed at the beginning of the lesson. So we ask the question, as the invitation is for you, we ask the invitation, are you ready to become that kind of disciple? That kind of radical disciple. That kind of disciple that serves Jesus. That kind of radical disciple, hear this, that can be rewarded in heaven. If you're here and ready to respond to it, come up here and let us know as we stand and we sing.